Dare Recycling, it turns out I have a really shallow view of this topic. It was a bit surprising to me, actually, because it's an easy topic to understand. But once you get into the nuances of Dare Recycling, it turns out I was exposed and I didn't actually know that much. Now, I'm not a financial planner, so I don't have those expertise. And that's why I've got the expert, Cole Frost in from Edvest. In this video, we're digging into the basics of debt recycling. It's going to form part of a series of videos that take a deeper look at debt recycling. So hit that subscribe button for future videos on the topic. Let's get into it. Carl, thanks for jumping on. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me and um, yeah, keen to get into it. Yeah, well, I've done a debt recycling video in the past and actually got a lot of traction. So I thought, why not get the debt recycling guy, the guy who's qualified, your qualified financial advisor, to have a chat about debt recycling. Awesome. And yeah, thanks for the, the qualification. I think certainly a qualification on the investment and on the tax side, but uh, that's where mortgage brokers come in, in terms of, I think we, we both have a huge amount of value in terms of need that for the structuring side of things. I could tell you from kind of my experience with my client base and really my viewer base as well is they kind of understand these concepts in a very kind of distant way. So they kind of get it and debt recycling you could you could probably figure it out basically how it works but actually when you start digging into the weeds which is kind of what we did off camera previously when chatting there's actually a lot more to it than meets the eye so before we kind of dig into the weeds a bit do you mind giving um, the audience a bit of a broad idea of what it is maybe the 60 second version yeah, so debt recycling is, first of all, to be able to debt recycle, you need to have the cash. So you need to have adequate emergency funds. And then from there, you need to be able to like, well, I have the decision to pay down my mortgage, which is obviously non-deductible, or can I invest? And if you do want to invest, that's when you debt recycle. So what debt recycling is, it's it's kind of the, the best of both worlds in terms of paying down the mortgage and investing. So what you do is you pay down the mortgage and then you re-borrow those funds and then you invest to get the tax advantage. And I would say it's, if you think of it that way, it sounds quite simple. Um, but I, I think that's where mortgage brokers come in because unfortunately there needs to be that separation. So it's a bit tidier and you can track it from a tax point of view. Yeah, I think uh, the clarity. So when you're trying to show the tax man, you should be able to basically just show your statements and that should be able to provide information to the tax man or your accountant. Um, who tells the taxman as to what's actually happened. And that's really important because if you just go about it willy-nilly, things start going downhill. And the longer you can kind of piece it together with sticky tape, the worse it actually breaks in the future. It's probably a good place to start in terms of looking at what are the main mistakes that people make when they try and go, go about implementing this sort of strategy. Yeah, I would probably say the, the first mistake is that I know I would say most people do this is they, they don't do it at all um, with that. And you could probably take that back and, and probably separate that as well in terms of they think it's all too confusing. So they literally don't do anything. So they just keep it in their cash account, into their offset account or in the redraw, or they don't debt recycle at all in terms of they just take it out of their offset account and then they just go and open up a Perler account and then invest in ETFs or anything like that. So I, I would think that that's the, I, I guess, the biggest mistake because then they're paying the interest anyway on it and they're missing out on the tax deductions. I think the next mistake is then is if they do find out about debt, debt recycling or just debt, debt structuring more generally is that that's when kind of they kind of know enough to be dangerous and then that's where mixed loans can come about in terms of they might pay down the mortgage and then they just, I guess, take that straight out and then they've created the mixed loan. And people often ask, well, can I do this? Is it tax deductible? And I guess the short answer is yes uh, with that, but it's an accounting nightmare and it's something that can be quite hard to unpick and probably just unnecessary stress if you if you see a good broker. So let's say we're in the scenario where I'm a borrower and I've got a home loan and I've paid my home loan down and I've done really well. I've got kind of a smallish amount left. I've got a fair bit of equity in my property. So let's say I implement this strategy and I go to the mortgage broker, they get me a second loan, which is my investment loan. And this is the money I take to go and invest in property. What is the strategy there? So how does that work in terms of, you mentioned ETF, so I put it all in an ETF. And then what happens with the earnings from the ETF? What do we do there? Do we just roll that over into the ETF consistently or do we actually use that income to pay down the owner occupy mortgage. Yeah, I'll probably, to be honest, I'd, I'd take it back a step. And sometimes online, there can be a bit of kind of 
confusion even amongst like other financial advisors or financial commentators around the term debt recycling and it comes back to the the definition of equity and offsets um, can confuse that as well Um, because obviously like let's use an example of if somebody has um, a one million dollar home and they have a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage they have equity of obviously five hundred thousand dollars and they have usable equity in that situation of three hundred thousand so that's obviously at an 80 percent lvr of a million dollars so quite often uh, sometimes i find debt recycling can refer to the situation where somebody says well you have three hundred thousand dollars of usable equity so let's take that out in terms of borrow that and then invest that into an etf or in, into property like a, it's it's, a, it's the same concept with that and i would say that's borrowing to invest and that's a different kind of conversation because you're obviously taking on more risk that you can be rewarded obviously you're taking on more risk that can go the other way but in that situation that i wouldn't call that technical debt recycling if you do go down that avenue that's the way to structure it obviously to get the tax deductions that's a, a riskier strategy whereas with debt recycling i kind of like to think of it you're not actually taking on more risk than you otherwise would because you've already made the decision that i want to invest so using that example again let's say there's five hundred thousand. let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars sitting in the offset account so your i guess net debt that you're paying interest on is four hundred thousand dollars and you're like yep i want to invest that one hundred thousand with that that is like when you you would pay down the loan to four hundred thousand dollars take it out of the offset account and then redraw that so your debt goes back up to five hundred thousand so your, your kind of total debt level in terms of your net debt level hasn't actually gone up but you've put that money into the investment portfolio so then from there that's when you, you you're into the etf portfolio or a share portfolio like my investment philosophy generally and quite popular online like i don't have a monopoly on it, a passive investment etf portfolio that's generally my preference but it works with shares um, private companies property obviously as well so with that it'd be a case of using that um, the reborrowed funds from the debt recycling and then investing that into an etf portfolio in this scenario and then the important thing is that for the interest to be tax deductible, it actually has to uh, pay income, so pay distributions, pay dividends, or have an expectation to. If it doesn't, so sometimes people might say, well, I want a debt recycler, I want to go buy Tesla shares or something like that, or Bitcoin. And then in that situation, it's not tax deductible, it's actually cost-based related. So there, you could argue there is a tax benefit and you would you would still structure it that way if that's what you wanted to do. But you don't get the immediate tax deductions of that as a, a rather the, I guess, annual interest bill that's added to the cost base uh, with that. So I would say for most people to debt recycle it, it is into like an ETF portfolio or something like that that generates dividends or, or distributions in the case of ETFs. And then with those distributions that come in, that goes against the non-deductible debt. So in the previous example, jumping that back to that, that was $400,000. So in that situation, you, you take those distributions, you pay down that non-deductible $400,000 loan. And then that's kind of the first step of debt recycling. And I think that like obviously debt recycling, and like I think the concept, like you think of the like on, on your garbage bin, the recycling logo, like it, it's a um, it's circular. Um, so that's where the term comes in. I think people can get caught up in uh, in terms of debt recycling because then from there you you take out those distributions and your annual cash flows that are paid down that non deductible debt, and then reborrow that, and that's kind of like it's an ongoing process, and that is technical debt recycling. But often uh, I think people get too confused with that, and then. So it's all too hard. I'm not going to do anything. Whereas generally, it's usually that first part. If they do that right and get comfortable with the strategy, build up more cash, like that's usually um, the way I find in, in reality it happens. Because let's say that you pay down the loan by a thousand dollars in that first year from, from dividends or something like that. In practice, you're probably not going to go to the bank and get a thousand dollars back. It's probably going to be in, in larger amounts, and it's not it's not a perfect world. Unfortunately, we've lending practicalities and investment practicalities as well with brokerage and ETF parcels and different things like that. Right. So let me just summarize what you said, just so we're on the same page here. So I've got my loan. I've got extra money that I'm paying into the loan or the offset account. Let's say, for example, I build up an extra 50 grand over a period of time. I can then basically take out that 50 grand, sorry, as a as an investment loan. And then I use that money to invest in an ETF in, in this example. And then with those dividends from the ETF or those payments from the de- ETF, the income from it, then we use that to pay down my home loan, not the investment one, but the yep. home loan, because the home loan has the interest I'm not claiming as a deduction on it versus the yep. investment loan I took out. I'm claiming that interest of the deduction. So I don't want to pay that loan off until I've paid off the loan against my own home. Is that correct? Yeah, that's perfect. And you can simplify it in terms of the terminology, like non-deductible debt is commonly known as bad debt. 
and then the duck to deductible debt is good debt. So obviously bad, you want to pay down that first and then pay down the good debt potentially like that's a separate decision once you've graduated from the first step, I guess, and pay down that bad debt. There's the other quite common question because like you hear about compound investment returns and different things like that and people like dividend reinvestment plans to automate it takes the decision away from yourself. So sometimes people say, well, should I debt recycle? You know, can I enroll in the dividend reinvestment plan? So you don't actually receive that cash rather it's just reinvested. You, you can do that, um, obviously, but then you're missing out on the, the benefit of the recycling from the investment income um, because then you, you're not fully optimizing it because the, you, you're not getting the opportunity to take those dividend distributions and then pay down the bad debt. You kill, can still do it. Usually the most powerful element of debt recycling is is like ongoing cash flows. So if you're saving a thousand dollars a month or whatever it might be for, for your particular situation or family or, or whatever, that's what's going to for most people. I would say almost everyone. That's what's going to pay down the non-deductible debt and then give you the opportunity to reborrow that to invest. And then that's where kind of the power of the compounding comes about. The other kind of point I would make is I think debt recycling. Like the, if you actually model it out. So let's again use that, jumping back to that example of five hundred thousand dollars of non-deductible. Debt. So if you think up here that there's five hundred thousand dollars of debt, and of that, that that's the bad debt, that, that's going to go down over time, just as you have like the distributions coming in and your general cash flow. And then what you kind of think is at five hundred thousand dollars, a perfect debt recycling strategy in terms of fully optimized is that at the end of that, that five hundred thousand dollars is repaid. And then you can kind of think of an X in terms of the good debt as like it's gone up at the exact same pace. So at the end of the day, at the start. You have five hundred thousand dollars of bad debt that's here, zero dollars of good debt that's here, and then over time they kind of counterbalance each other. So at the end of the day, there's five hundred thousand dollars of good debt up here, and then zero dollars of bad debt. That's I guess in that's the perfect answer of debt recycling. I think in practice it, that doesn't generally happen. I think and there's also risk profiles that come into it as well that people might just choose a nominated amount in terms of they say, well, I have fifty thousand dollars here that I want to invest up front, and then I I want to make I want to pay down some non deductible debt because there's also the other I guess misconception at the moment, and it's kind of I guess a legacy problem from obviously when interest rates were low that when interest rates rates were really low. It was common for debt recycling strategies to actually pay down your bad debt, your non-deductible debt faster than if you kind of didn't do a debt recycling or an investment strategy at all and you just put all that cash flow into the um, into the, the bad debt and then you decided, then you started to invest in um, at the end of that period. So that might be 10, 15, 20 years away, 30 years away, depending on your mortgage situation. Whereas at the moment where interest rates are, it's almost always the case, whereas interest rates are going to they're higher than the, the yield on any kind of ETF or investment portfolio. So what that actually does is it actually slows down paying down that bad debt. And people say, hang on, why would I do it then? And that's because you have a counterbalancing portfolio that's growing over time with that. So you could pay down that bad debt by selling down some of that portfolio. And in that situation, you would pay it down earlier. But just looking at the cash flows, you need to be in a situation where you're kind of in a good good position and have cash flow surpluses so that you can kind of service that negative gearing that's actually happening at the moment because like the income that's coming in is generally slightly less than obviously the interest that you'd be paying at six six and a half recording in middle of 2024. We're going to dig into this in a lot more detail in future episodes. <laughs> that's, that's what I talked about the at the start, the, nu- the nuances of, of debt recycling. It feels like something where I'm kind of on the sidelines of it. It feels like this big thing that was nowhere near as big as what I first thought it was. Think of the TARDIS on, uh, what is it, Doctor Who? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> young, young people probably won't know what I mean by that, but that's okay. Just to summarize what you're saying then is when interest rates were a lot lower, paraphrasing a lot here, the debt recycling strategy worked a lot better. It was a lot more effective because um, the interest rates were a lot cheaper, but you do have um, offsetting forces. So you've got things, for example, the actual shares are going up in value over time as well. So I guess what I'm trying to trying to say is it's not so one dimensional, which is kind of probably more the approach I had to, toward it in the beginning and probably still have that approach now because I'm admittedly, I'm in finance, but I'm pretty ignorant to kind of different disciplines so yeah there's a lot more to it that's what we're going to explore in future episodes yeah no i'd probably jump in there and i'd probably say like it's not one dimensional and i wouldn't make the argument that it doesn't necessarily work as well as it did um in prior times um, when obviously interest rates were lower so the concept of it paying down the debt that that doesn't um that kind of element of the of the strategy that objectively doesn't work as well 
There's the other argument if you've decided to invest that interest rates are higher, so you're actually getting a higher tax deduction. So some people would say based on that level, um, based on that element of it, that it works better because you're paying more interest. Naturally, there you're getting more tax deductions. There's the other decision and sometimes that people can think that debt recycling is a no-brainer and it's a no-brainer if you want to invest. So another element to it, and we'll get into this in other episodes, is that it's an investment decision first and foremost and then then obviously the, the tax structuring comes second to it. So that obviously interest rates are six, six and a half, depending on your mortgages at the moment. Probably the long-term return expectation of the share market or a diversified portfolio, depending who you're asking, it's probably eight, eight and a half percent before tax. So based on that, like uh, over the long term, like based on those, uh, I guess it's high level numbers that it makes sense. Probably I don't have as many inquiries and not as much excitement online as when interest rates were two and a half percent and different things like that, because people obviously did well out of that trade um, at that point in time. So I often say that it still makes sense. Maybe Maybe not go as hard as people might have in previous times and I would never say or anything like that but um, <laughs> I'm finding a lot more people and uh, like me advising on a lot more strategies where using that example again of $100,000 it might be a case of saying well $50,000 in the offset because you're, you're getting a good after tax return of 6.5% effectively by keeping in the offset account but maybe we'll debt recycle the other $50,000 so you're diversifying a little bit and still have an exposure to the share market in addition to you might have some in your superannuation or something like that. Often we want the right answer in terms of I've got the option to pay down my mortgage or keep it in the offset, or I've got the option to invest, aka debt recycle. So that's what you would do. And it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be any percentage in between, if that makes sense. Before you leave, where can people find you? Maybe give them your, your website for your, your, your calculator. So I'm an independent financial advisor and I've typically always worked for millennials or probably people in their 30s and 40s, I would say. And I probably never set out to specialize in debt recycling, but I was just more and more finding that that was my, uh, I guess, average customer. Um, and now I'd say almost everyone I work with is, is some kind of element of a debt recycling strategy. So with that, I was kind of, Wanting, I went down the path of how do I help more people and Edbest came along. So edbest.com.au, it's a debt recycling course where we're kind of going through these conversations and chatting about well, what it is, what the benefit is, and then obviously what the practicalities are to, I guess, structure it and then what kind of portfolio you put that into. So you can find me there. I have a debt recycling calculator online where you can download it. It's just a Google sheet that you have full access to. And um, from there, you can plug in your numbers, your own situation in terms of what your income is, what your hours and different things like that, what your savings are. And there you can kind of see over a number of years what that benefit is based on your situation, your mortgage. Nice. You can always leave comment below. Also, stay tuned. Just subscribe. Also, Kyle, I don't know if you mentioned your, you've got your channel as well. What's the YouTube channel name? Yeah, so I have, have my um, YouTube channel as well. So that's kyle.headbest. And also, if you put any comments um, in, in this video as well, I'll keep an eye and let me know, Will, and I'll um, answer any questions that you have on debt recycling or investing more generally in the comments on this video. Okay, sounds good. Thanks again, Kyle.